uh, uh, like a corporate time of worship, but that means that you're adding to that, right? You didn't come just to receive, but you come to to add to that corporate worship. And I was once, uh, I, I was at a worship conference many years ago, and and I never forget the teaching. And it said the teaching um, was about the little pieces of glass that make up a, a, a stained glass window, you know, and, and it's basically, in some of those, it's like a little cut up thing there. I believe they're called tociferous or something along those lines, but um, those little, if you found that little piece of glass on the ground, you would think it was trash and you would throw it away. And so it doesn't mean anything uh, unless it's part of that stained glass window, right? But without that little piece, that stained glass window is not complete. And that's what you are. You are a little piece of, of God's glory that he has individually placed on you. And when we come together in a corporate setting, we come with our little piece to offer it. And we offer it to one another, right? We, we worship together. And of course, we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's, it's for him, but it's together. Some people think, well, it's between me and God, and I believe that there's some truth to that too. But the reality is, is it's between you, God, and his people. See, we are the church. The church is not an individual. It's a body, right? It's a body of individuals. It's a body of people that come together under the banner of Christ to worship. And so I want to encourage you as we get together today, remember that you are part of the worship, of the corporate worship of God's people. Does that make sense? You say, I'm a part? I, I don't think some of you were listening. Let me say it all over again. Let me say it all over again. There's these little pieces of glass. No, I'm just kidding. Say, I'm a part. And I'm going to do my part. Look to your brother and say, brother, I, I commit to doing it with you. Right? We're going to do it together. Right? We're going to do it together. In the name of the Lord. Holy God, we worship you and we honor you, King of Kings. And we commit this time to you for the glory of your name. Amen and amen. Amen. When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the life, you are the fight that's in my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We are more. sin or to shame who we are defiant in your name you are the fire that cannot be tamed you are the power in our veins our lord our god our conqueror Woo! Sing into the night, Christ is risen and on high. Greater is He living in me than in the world. Yeah. No surrender, no retreat. We are free and we redeem. We will declare over despair. You Yes, you have overcome this world, this life. Woo! We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. We are defiant in the name. You are the power in our day. Our Lord.
is impossible Every chain is breakable With you we are victorious You are stronger than the hearts You are greater than the dark With you, come on We are victorious Everybody now Believe this with you. We are victorious. We are victorious. We are more than conquerors. Shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God. We are loving conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world. cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father of lights, we look to you.
good comes from our God. And we sing. Yes, everything good comes from you, Father of light. Your love will always pierce through the darkest night. Everything, everything good comes from you, yes, Father of As I've said in the past, everything, all the songs that we sing, they just keep speaking to me in a different way. And this, this time, and I, I feel like I've been going through some dark times in my life, right? And uh, just hard times. And it's hard to. It's hard to see. It's hard to see the uh, the light sometimes, and so I've been dealing with uh, a lot of back pain, a lot of back pain, and uh, for the 
the last two years, and uh, and God stepped in after crying out. I feel like uh, God showed me what I had to do. And you know, sometimes it's a long time that we have to wait. It's not just a week, sometimes it's years. And um, after waking up, just sometimes about to cry just because I wake up in pain. Waking up every one to two hours at night because I can't get comfortable. And this is just a long process. God showed me the how simple it was to just uh, get out of that. I feel like it's a miracle. So now um, you might see me a little more upbeat because now I'm not like this with my back. Um, man, and I can, I feel like 10 years younger. I'm not going to lie. And I just like, feel like, man, God is so good. Jesus was, uh, Jesus is so good. Uh, but it taught me a lot of things, right? It teaches you patience. It te- teaches you to trust in God. But it also taught me, because I have a problem with this, in procrastinating things. You know, uh, we put things off because maybe we think they're not going to work. So we automatically say, ah, it's probably not for me. I, I, I doubt it's going to do anything. Um, and, and we put it off for years sometimes. And um, I personally have to stop doing that. And, and God showed me that because as soon as I just finally gave in, okay, I'll try it. Um, it was three days later, no back pain. So... seemed like such a crazy thing and then it was resolved in three days and I'm, I'm gonna hold on to this I'm gonna hold on to this um, God is so good let's let's keep singing let's keep singing the kid.
never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down, never. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. No. and lift up your hands and say you're good yeah you're good oh you are good come on you're good oh you are good come on and confess it you're good oh you are good you're good oh we worship you king we worship you, hallelujah. We worship you, King of kings. You are good, Lord, you are good. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. When I was little, I remember any time I faced a, a struggle or a difficulty, my parents would always tell me, you know, what Philippians 4 and verse 13 says. And, Basically, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, when you're a little kid and you hear that, you know, I, I, I was a, a Superman fan. And so you always, I, I would always associate it with like, Man, I can do anything with Christ who strengthens me. And now that I've gotten, you know, obviously older, uh, just so you know, I'm still a Superman fan. It's okay. I believe it's okay. But, uh, um, now I, I really understand who Superman is. And, and see, later on there in Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, And my God shall supply for all of your needs according to his riches in glory. And lately I've just been meditating on that. And, and I want to encourage you. You know, we need to meditate on God's word. You know, you, you need to like savor it, toss it around, think about it some more. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean according to to his riches in glory. And as I was meditating on it, I realized that God's riches in glory are not necessarily money. You know, yes, in Philippians 4, Paul is actually saying, I've learned that I can live in abundance and I can live in need because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So he's saying, there's going to be times that are not going to be fun. There's not going to, there's going to be times that are not going to be like, oh man, this, this, this moment in my life is awesome. But I know that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And so as I meditated on that, I'm like, what's, what are his riches and glory? So what does God's treasury hold? 
And then I realized that he holds treasures for every part of my being. You know, there are moments when I don't need money, I need peace. There are moments when I don't need, you know, um, like, like, I don't know, I, I don't need a ton of money because let, let's be honest, money can't buy everything. Do you know what I mean? Like if, if you're sick or if your child is sick or you're going through a season of trials, you know, money's not gonna, money's not gonna supply that, that peace. Only the presence of God can supply that peace. And I, and I really felt this morning, you know, some of us, we've been looking at the wrong fountain to provide for us. And I really feel like God wants to minister to some people today. I really feel this, this song is so appropriate. You know, you are good. You're good, Lord. We, sometimes we just need to recognize it. We need to confess it. We need to stand on the truth. Because yes, you're going to get bombarded with lies. You're going to get bombarded with thoughts of defeat. You're going to get bombarded with thoughts of anxiety and what's going on and what am I supposed to do. But you know what? In all of that, God is always good. He doesn't change. He doesn't stop being good. We've been singing it over and over this morning. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no shadow of turning. We just sang it, right? Everything good comes from you, Father of light. Well, that's, that's what the scripture says. We can stand on that truth. And I really feel like if, if you're struggling this morning, like you've been going through a season of just like anxiety or you're going through a season of, of, of discomfort, you're going through a season where you don't have peace, I want to invite you to just make your way to the altar as we continue to worship. I'm going to have the leaders minister to you a little bit. We're going to just keep worshiping for just a little bit longer. But if you need to experience the, the riches in glory of God, I want to invite you to come to the front. I know there's some people here. You're just in need of a divine touch of God. Come on. Just fill up the altar. Go, go as far as you can so that we know who you are. You know, and, and I'm telling you, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. Come on, my God shall supply all of your needs, all of your needs, all of your emotional needs, all of your physical needs, all of your spiritual needs, all of your financial needs. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory.
stand together, Lord, as your sons and daughters all stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all the one who gave you all. So all stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrender. wide open all stand in all Thank you for being such a good father, yes. Lord. Lord, I thank you for being the true and faithful one. Yes, God, just there where you're at, just thank him thank you, for all the goodness uh, of his goodness in your life. Because in the midst of different trials, of different circumstances, he remains true and faithful. And when we can remember that he is a true and faithful one, we can walk through, through those valleys and stand firm on his promises because we know who our daddy is. Yes. We know that he's got us. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for that peace that surpasses all understanding. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives, Lord. We worship you and we honor you. We give you all the glory because only you are worthy, Lord. So we honor you today. Let's give God a hand clap this morning because He is good. He's so good. Hallelujah. Amen. If everyone would just quickly just find their seats and if we can turn on the house lights before we move on to greeting time. So many of you may not know this, but um, October is supposed to be like boss appreciation uh, month and uh, it's also Pastor Appreciation Month, and so we want to, to recognize a couple of um, the pastors of this house because they serve the Lord faithfully, and the Bible says that they who teach are worthy of double honor. And I, I want to just bless um, these pastors that are here this morning. We're going to bless some of the others in the second service, but I want to invite pastors Josh and Grace Angerton and pastors Damian and Janine Parle to come on up here and... And we just want to honor them. Um, on behalf of all of Lifehouse, we wanted to thank you for all of the diligence in your work and, and your heavy labor in the Lord. And we want to just bless you guys this morning uh, for all that you do. People may not know it. People may not see it, uh, what you do on a, on a weekly basis. But we want to honor you. And uh, I, this, this is actually a gift from all of Lifehouse. And, and uh, you know, it's a little succulent so that you will keep it for many years, right? 
wanted to give you something that might live for a long time. <laughs> and so would you just help me honor these men and women uh, today in the name of the Lord? And uh, let's just pray over them. Let's pray blessings over their lives. Holy God, I thank you for these pastors and leaders of this house, Lord God, and all the diligence in their work as they labor, Lord, to minister to your people, Lord, as they co-labor with you as under shepherds. And, Father, we bless them today in the name of Jesus. We bless them, Lord God, with, with strength of, of body, Lord, that they might be able to serve you for a long time. I, we pray for strengthening in their soul, Lord God, so that their emotions may be focused on you and continue and persevere. And, Father, may their spirits be strengthened so that they will have a divine fellowship with you all the days of their lives. Lord God, we thank you that your face shines upon them and your glory moves around them and in them and through them. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the anointing that you have placed on their lives to teach, to preach, to, to, to guide, to lead. Lord, we bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Would you take a moment and just greet those around you? Give them a big hug in the name of the Lord, especially if you don't know them. Make sure you get to know somebody, you know, because we remember that for us, church is family and family is church. I'm ready. Uh, you know, that worship was amazing. I love worshiping the Lord and, and, and giving my heart to him while, while we do that. And I just want to um, just want to encourage you to open up, uh, you know, your, your heart and be like, God, uh, what do you have for me today? What what is it? What are you trying to tell me tonight? The yeah. pastor Jorge will be uh, preaching about changing a culture of darkness, which we need this right. in our society yes. today, which is getting darker and darker but we need to be the light in the mist so so that's that's what we got um uh, thank you for connecting i see you santiago jeff uh, welcome judy and gary and emmanuel love you guys thank you for connecting and 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 uh welcome right so if you don't write anything we don't know who you are or if you're watching so That's please right. just give us like a thumbs up or a heart emoji or or something to let us know that you're available because we can't see your name unless you type something so again we're just so right. um, blessed and privileged to be here with you guys today and we really hope you enjoy the message um, get your pen and paper out yes. um, take notes um, and don't forget Prayer request. Prayer request. All right. Um, yeah, just let us know how your week has been also, you know. There's always something to just be thankful for, something to, to pray the um, to praise the Lord for. Amen. All right. Let's see let's, you at the end. Let's get ready to uh, receive the word. In Jesus' name. See you. See you guys.
It is. If you have any questions, please speak to your life group leader, and they will have all the answers for you, where you're meeting and what time and all of that. So, um, yes, Father of Lights, don't miss out. It's Monday night. We also have something for your calendar. November 19th is the Blended and Blessed Conference here at our church. It's from 3 to 5. If you have any questions, please speak with Charity Russell. She has all the answers for you. Wonderful. So children, if you want to come on up, ages 3 to 10, come on up to the front and we can pray for you. And 11, 12, and 13-year-olds, head to the back for our Level Up ministry. Okay, guys, if you will extend your hands to these beautiful children, we will pray for them. God, thank you so much. Thank you that you've given these kids to us for such a short time, Father, to, to love and to raise and to um, teach them to walk in your ways, Father. God, I just pray, God, I just pray, Father, for, for the time that we have them, for the time uh, that they are learning and growing, God, that you would just bless them, God. We pray for today, God, as they learn about you all-knowing, you're an all-knowing God, that they would just, that would just really touch their hearts, that you are always with them and you never leave them, Father. And we pray for safety in everything that we do today in kids' ministry. And we put, thank you for the tithes, and we just pray blessing over them now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good job. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, if you will stand with me to honor our pastor. like this you know if you want like a big chest you know so holy god we come before you and we're expectant of what you want to do and what you have to say and so father i bless your people in your name and i pray god open our hearts and our understanding lord that we may be the people that that uh that are worthy of the sacrifice of the lamb in jesus name amen and amen you may take your seats well, good, good morning once again. I want to just take this time to encourage you. Um, as you may know, we are preparing to do what we call the Father of Lights Festival. And um, in case you're not aware about what Father of Lights Festival is, it is an outreach that we do every year on October 31st. And it is... Uh, it is it is intended, right, to, to be the light in our generation. And actually, I've, I want to uh, take a moment uh, off of our uh, series that we've been doing on healing. Uh, next week, we'll start uh, what it means to have a healthy body. So, oh, man, get ready, right? We're all going to get rebuked, right? Because uh, besides Robert here, I don't think anybody else can say, you know, uh, that guy works out, like, all the time, and I'm sure he eats healthy. Right, Rob? I don't know. Do you? Pretty healthy? Man, got, like, 0% body fat, that guy. Anyway, uh, I want to talk about what it means to have a healthy body. And and, and I want to address it not in the sense, like, man, you need to be working out once a week. But we're the our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and, and I believe that God has called us to serve him for a long time. And if our bodies aren't healthy, we can't serve him. And that's what's going to be the focus over the next few weeks. But I wanted to take a time off today, and I, I've actually titled this message, Changing a Culture of Darkness, and, and it's because I want you to understand why we do what we do, and especially in regards to Father of Lights. I've shared with you many times uh, in, in the past that um, when I was little, uh, we were told we don't celebrate Halloween. That's, that, was the, that was the message that I received in my house, right? We don't celebrate Halloween. You know, I remember being little in Mexico, and, and Halloween would come around, and, and, and everybody would be outside. And, and you have to understand, in Mexico, everybody's, everybody's outside. You know, come 6 o'clock at night, like the whole neighborhood is outside in the streets. As a matter of fact, when I moved to the United States, I was 9 years old when I moved to the United States, and I got freaked out. Because I remember driving down our street at 6 o'clock, and there was nobody on the streets. And I remember thinking, like, Dad, where, where did you bring us, Dad? This place is scary. 
you know? You brought us to America. This place is scary. You know, I'm like, there's nobody on the streets. I, I, I didn't know what was going on because in Mexico, you know, in the, in the afternoons and in the evenings, pretty much the whole neighborhood's outside. You're just playing outside. All the, all the people are outside and, you know, the, the neighbors are talking and the kids are playing. And, and you do that till the late hours of the night. I mean, even on school nights, you just be out there till, till, till really, really late. It's just that, that culture. And so, um, but come Halloween, we were told, nope, you're coming inside. And we, we couldn't go outside. And my parents were people that were, that were very passionate for Jesus. And they're the kind of people that if, that if their pastor said, you know, you're not supposed to watch TV, they wouldn't watch TV. You know, when I grew up and, and I was little and in our, in our house, we couldn't have a deck of cards because they were of the devil, right? I mean. I hate to say it that way, but that's, that's, that's cool. We were told, you know, cards are of the devil, right? And so we couldn't have cards at home. I remember, I, I remember when I brought home my first deck of cards. I was in high school, and I started, I started playing spades with, my, with some of my classmates in, in, uh, in, in high school. And, um, and I remember bringing home my first deck of cards. It was like bringing home a pack of cigarettes. You know what I mean? It was like to that extent, you know, that's how it was looked down upon. And so um, there was a time in the history of the church where, um, there was a, a, a major distribution company that, that, that somehow in the Christian world, people began to say that they had made a pact with the devil to be successful, and so we shouldn't buy their products. And I remember my parents, they would, my mom would go around the store, and she would flip the, the, the label to make sure that the products she was buying were not from that you know, distribution company, and, and, and that's the way that my parents grew up. It, it wasn't wrong. It was just that's what they understood it meant to be godly, right? We, they wanted to be so distinctly different to the world that, that if the pastor said this was, this was of the devil, like they were not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. And, and, and you know what? I'm not saying that's wrong because I, I still think that there are things we should not touch with a 10-foot pole. We need to be wary. We need to, we need to stay away from those things. And, 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 and we have treated them sometimes with, with contempt. And, and we don't, then we wonder why we're worldly. And so as I became pastor, Christy and I, we really felt like we wanted to change the culture of this church and, and, and so that it, would, it wouldn't be so legalistic and, and that we would be really scripture driven and that we would really focus on what the word of God said. If it was in the word, we were going to preach it, but we were not going to tell people this was wrong unless the Bible specifically said that. Right. And, and that's the way we, we we decided we would operate, that we were going to move in a different way and, and try to change the culture. And so it, it was it was good. But, you know, like with all life, you go from one extreme and you tend to kind of push towards the other extreme. Are you with me? You know, what I mean, like you're you're you've been walking so much in this way that you kind of want to go the opposite way. And so you, you almost become this way. And one day I was I was praying, I was meditating with the Lord and and I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, in your pursuit to be less religious, you have become worldly. Does that make sense? Like we were pursuing to be less religious, but now we were becoming worldly in our pursuit. And, and there's a danger of us as Christians in not wanting to be super spiritual and not wanting to, to, you know, be rejected by culture that somehow we, we actually start blurring the lines and, and then we don't realize that we're becoming actually affected by the world. And, and, and I really believe that for us to be efficient as lights, as the light that God has called us to be, we're going to have to understand that there are certain things where the line has to be drawn pretty clearly. And so when, I, when we talk about Halloween, I want you to understand we don't celebrate Halloween. Let me just put it that. This is the black and white. We don't celebrate Halloween. Why? Because it is a holiday that celebrates darkness. And if you study the roots of it, it is definitely rooted in darkness. There is no example. Yeah, but that was the way it was originally. Well, it's still that way. Yes, it's become much more commercialized. Yes, it's become like, oh, but what's wrong? The kids want to dress up as princesses and, you know, and, and as superheroes. And you know what I mean? And, and I'm telling you, even the disguise thing has its roots in some darkness. The reason people got disguised is because they had some dark, you know, um, implications and 
and, and I'm going to be honest. Here it is. You do your homework, right? You get out and do your homework. And don't just read one article. Read like 20, 25, 30 articles until you can get as much information as possible. Because you should never develop convictions based on what one person tell, tells you. Does that make sense? You need to do your homework. You need to do your research. But I will tell you, sometimes it's pretty simple. When my daughter was four years old, we went to, to a store, and she saw this picture of a, of a monster at, a, like, I think it was Burger King. And she saw this picture of this monster, and first instinct was to say, ah, that's ugly. Like, the, the natural aspects of the simplicity of a child, they understood that that was not pretty. Does that make sense? So sometimes we need to just see things in a simple fashion. But I will tell you that God has called us not to, not to attack the culture, but to change the culture. And so when we started Father of Lights, it was our desire not to say this is the alternative to Halloween. But from, from like I want it to be to where somewhere down the line, when people think of October 31st, they're not thinking of Halloween. They are thinking of those houses with the white lights. That's what I want them to think. They, yeah, they realize it's Halloween. The world is hell celebrating Halloween. But when they think of October 31st, they're thinking of, of, of that place. Because we're not just going to stand and be like, that's wrong. I'm not going to cry out and just counter the culture and be those people that are like, that's wrong. Though you shouldn't do that. And, and you know what I mean? You will never affect another life by just telling them something's wrong. Does that make sense to you? You're not just going to go around like, I mean, tell me if you've gone up to someone who's like a, a terrible sinner. You're like, you're a disgusting sinner. And they're like, oh, what can I do to be saved? Right? Like, like, thank you for telling me. You know, it's like they wanted to change in that moment. No, you'll never, you will never do that. Jesus went around and, you know, the only people he told that were ugly and disgusting was the religious people. Those are the ones he countered and he, and he got angry at. But with everybody else, he, he, he had this manner to him that, that he attracted people, in the, the worst of people. And he, he ate with them, and he, and he loved them. And they were challenged by that love. And so I want to talk to you today about changing a culture of darkness. And I want to begin today, I, I, this wasn't in my notes, but I, I really want to begin in, 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 in um, Isaiah chapter 5. So sorry for the uh, lyrics because I'm throwing you a little loop here. But Isaiah chapter 5, and, and I want you to just understand um, what a culture of darkness uh, looks like. I'm going to begin with verse 20, okay? Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Now you need to understand Isaiah uh, is, is a divine prophet of the Lord. God used him tremendously. As a matter of fact, Isaiah is probably like, in terms of Bible prophecy, I would say he is you know, the most renowned of the prophets because his prophecies are just so powerful. And a lot of the uh, prophecies about Jesus Christ the, and the fulfilled, the fulfilled prophecies of Jesus Christ are found in Isaiah. And plus, I mean, Isaiah 53 is like without comparison in any other prophetic word. But Isaiah was ministering to the people of, of Judah and, and he's, he's rebuking them, obviously, for for, uh, for not serving the Lord and for not chasing after him. As a matter of fact, Isaiah chapter 5 begins by saying the Lord planted a vineyard and he expected the vineyard to, to bear fruit and the vineyard, you know, kind of didn't bear fruit. So what should the Lord do with that vineyard? And of course, that vineyard is Israel, right? So now God is speaking against it. But look at Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. It says like this. Those who call evil good and good evil are as good as dead. Who turn darkness into light and light into into darkness, who turn bitter into sweet and sweet into bitter. Those who think they are wise are as good as dead. Those who think they possess understanding. Those who are champions at drinking wine are as good as dead, who display great courage when mixing strong drinks. Verse 24, therefore, as a flaming fire devours straw, and dry grass disintegrates in the flames, so their root will rot and their flower will blow away like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord who commands armies. They have spurned the commands 
of the Holy One of Israel. And so I want to talk about changing a culture of darkness. But for us to talk about what it means to change a culture of darkness, we have to define darkness properly. What is darkness? You know, when we think of darkness, of course, we think of a room with no light. And, and that makes sense, right? It was dark in there, right? It's dark. So something that, so the, the easiest definition, perhaps, Einstein said it like this. Darkness does not exist. It is the absence of light. And the reason that Einstein said that is because for something to truly exist, it has to be able to be measured. Well, you can't measure darkness. Light can be measured, but darkness can't. And so in Einstein's brain, he concluded that darkness is not real. It is just the absence of light. And for us as Christians, that should kind of tell us something. You know what I mean? We, we are dealing with a world that is under darkness, and why is it under darkness? Well, perhaps because it is absent of light. When speaking biblically, darkness is identified with chaos, with confusion, and with wickedness. So if you research the Bible, what you will find when it speaks about darkness, it associates it with chaos, with confusion, with wickedness. As a matter of fact, in the beginning, the Bible says that the earth was without form and it was empty. And what else? And the Bible says, and darkness was over the face or the surface of the deep. The world was in chaos. It, it didn't have order. It was empty. And what else was there? Well, darkness was there. In the Bible, being in darkness is considered a curse. Romans chapter 1 and verse 21 says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So darkness in the Bible is associated with, with a curse. And it is synonymous with ignorance, confusion, and blindness. If a person is darkened in their mind or in their heart, it means that they are walking in ignorance, they are walking in confusion, and they are blind to the truth. As a matter of fact, the Bible also tells us that the works of darkness or those things that are done in darkness are shameful. They are shameful. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 and 12 in the, in, in the New Living Translation says like this, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in darkness secret. So those things that are associated with darkness, they're supposed to be shameful. And, and, and if we talk about the culture that we are living in today, and going back to Ephesians chapter, I mean to, to Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 where it says that generation that calls good evil and, and evil good, you know what I mean? Like, like they will die. They're, they're as good as dead. Well, you think about the, cur the culture that we live in today. There are things that 20 years ago were considered shameful. And today they're spoken about like they're spoken of as if they were like the most normal thing and you don't need to be ashamed of that. Let me give you an example and I'm sorry if you have virgin ears. So if you have virgin ears, cover your ears. Those with virgin ears. I doubt there's anyone here because, you know, I'm telling you from 11, 12, you're already hearing this, this stuff. You know, masturbation is one of those things. 20 years ago, masturbation was considered, like, shameful. Do you know what I mean? Like, people would, like, if you were caught masturbating, you were like, oh, you masturbate. And you were, like, ridiculed and looked down upon. And now they talk about it like it's the most normal thing. Right? Did I make you uncomfortable? Probably not. You know why? Because you don't have to listen to your pastor talk about it. You can go to Facebook today and just talk about it like it's normal. As a matter of fact, in the article section, they talk about it like it's normal. Right? And I know I probably violated somebody's ears today. I'm sorry. Come up to me after service. I'll pray for you. You know what I mean? I might... You might need a little bit of, it's okay, you know, if I scarred you. Um, I also know the one that can heal you of those scars. So, you'll be all right. 
But I'm telling you, like, the things that we used to think were done in secret, in darkness, under the cloud of darkness, are now out, so out in the open, and they're seen as, like, normal or common or, or natural. And, and that, should, that should, you know, like, really bring us to think, what's going on? What is going on? And we need to be really careful because, remember, darkness is associated with confusion, with ignorance, with blindness, and it's considered shameful. So when we talk about the light, well, you need to understand that the light is the remedy to darkness. The light is the remedy to darkness, and it is that which the Bible associates with bringing order and bringing truth, right? And who is the light? Well, Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 12, it says like this, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world. And the Bible says that he has delivered you and I from darkness or from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into his light. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. It says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Of course, this is talking about God the Father. But God the Father has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. And brought us into the kingdom of his son. And who is Jesus? He is light. If you read the, the Revelation, one of the most fascinating aspects of Revelation is that the Bible says that the sun will no longer exist. Like there will be no more sun. But the Bible says that there will also be so much light that there will be no shadows. Like think about that for a moment, okay? How much light does there need to be so that there are no shadows? I want you to think about this for a moment. Like right now there's a slight little gap between the floor and my shoe. And if I so just go like this, there's shadow. So for, for there to be no shadows, that light has to be so powerful that it completely engulfs me. That's how powerful that light needs to be, right? Can you guys just put um, silence on that? Just silence it? Okay, but just put silence on it. Okay. So... That light is so powerful. Well, the Bible says that in the new Jerusalem, Jesus will be the light. Jesus is the light. Like, he is so, he's like in the middle of the city. He's standing in the middle of the city, and there's so much light that there's no shadows. Well, the Bible says that even now, you and I have been already transferred from the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his son, Jesus. Can I tell you something? Here it is. Are you ready for this? Here it is. One of the reasons, as a Christian, if you're a Christian, if you, if you have given your life to Christ, one of the reasons you will be the most miserable sinner, you know what I mean? Like, you will, so what I'm telling you is, when you give your life to Christ, you're not, you're not going to be able to walk in sin anymore. Do you know why? Because you're not going to enjoy it. Oh, you'll do it, you'll do the sin, and then, you know, like, 10 minutes later, you're like, oh, why did I do that? I shouldn't have done that. You know what I mean? And you know why? You're going to be a miserable sinner. You know why? Because you're going to get convicted of sin. Because you're no longer walk in darkness. Because God transferred you out of the kingdom of darkness. People that sin, and, and, and they don't know Jesus, they don't know the difference, and they're super content in their sin. They love their sin. What's wrong with it? There are people today that think it's okay to, to violate a child. And they defend it. Psychologists defend it today. There's, this is like, you're twisted. So demented. Why? Because they don't have, they, they're walking in darkness. For them, it's like, what's wrong with it? And here's the thing. As a Christian, when you begin to say, what is wrong with it? You're walking a, a dangerous line. What is wrong with it? You know what? What is wrong with it should never be your question. You know what your question should be? How does this edify me? That should be your question. Well, what's wrong with it? 
What's wrong with, you know, having a little witchcraft? You, you know what I mean? Like, listen, in Mexico and probably around most of Latin America and probably even some of Anglo, you know, the, in the Anglo world, I know in Ireland for sure this will happen, but there's a lot of mixture between Christianity and, and some witchcraft, right? In Mexico, you know, if your child is having bad dreams, there are some priests, not all priests, but there are some priests that will say, okay, this is what you're going to do. Vas ir al curandero, you know? And curandero means the healer, but it's better translated as, you know, the witch doctor. You're going to go to the witch doctor down the street in the corner, and he's going to give you a cleansing spell. Okay, this is what he's going to do. And if you've seen some of that, they'll take an egg and they'll wave this egg over you and they'll supposedly giving you this, this cleansing. They're not cleansing you, man. They're dirting you up spiritually. Dude, that is witchcraft, okay? That is voodoo. That is garbage. And, and in Mexico, the priest is the one. That, here's, the, here's your prescription. Go down to the curandero. You know what I mean? You're like, what? Not all priests, but there are some, and especially in some of the smaller, more ignorant towns. I know people in this, in this church that have that had those experiences as children because their, their mom and dad were like, oh, ah, my pobrecita, my, my son, my daughter, and I got to get them healed up. And they would take them to this voodoo witch doctor. You're like, what are you thinking? Right? I mean, there's some serious garbage going on in the world, and we need to be the light. And the solution to the darkness is the light. And the Bible says we've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his son, Jesus, which is light. And you know what? Jesus, the Bible says, has made us the light. We've been transferred out of darkness into the kingdom of his son, and now we are the light. You are the light. Look to your neighbor and say, you are the light. Now, how bright are you shining? How bright are you shining? Let me, listen to this. This is Matthew. This is Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let me paraphrase this version for you, okay? There is no such thing as a secret service Christian. That's it. I'm part of the SS. Right? Undercover. Secret mission. There is no secret mission for the kingdom. I hate to tell you that. There's special forces, but there's no secret service. Do you know what I mean? You are the light. And the light should not be covered and put under a bowl. Can you imagine if we bought, like, do you know for, for, for LifeHouse to have all of this lighting, we've invested a lot of money. I don't even want to tell you how much money we've invested. Okay? We've invested a lot of money so that during worship you can have the, you know, the cool lights and you can have a, a great experience. You know what I mean? Like, you know, by the way, Jesus doesn't need the lights. We need the lights, but Jesus doesn't. But, you know, like, it's, it's for us so we can worship God better. And, and the people that do the lights, they're worshiping God through the lights and, and et cetera, et cetera. But, but, you know, we've invested a lot. Now imagine if we invested a ton of money on these lights and then every Sunday, we came and we put a veil over the lights. Like, we covered them. Like, why? What's the purpose of the light? To have it and then cover it. And that's exactly what this scripture is saying. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Let me tell you something. The world is going to want you to be quiet. The world is going to want you to not shine because they're like roaches, okay? You turn on the light, what do the roaches do? They, they scatter. There, there's, a, there, there's a term for that. What's, what's it called, Damien? Photo taxes. Those that hate the light will, will, you know, will scatter. Does that make sense? They don't want you to be the light. So they want, they want you to be like Moses coming down from the mountain. Oh, Moses, your face is shining on us, covered up. And Moses had to cover the light. Can you imagine? 
They were so afraid of God. The people were so afraid of God that they said, Moses, you go and you speak to God on our behalf, and then you come down and you represent God to us. And so Moses would go up, and he would spend this amazing time with God, and then he would come down, and then they would, they would be like, oh, Moses, don't look at us. Your face is shining. And that's what happens when we are the people of God, and you're truly in love with God. You are to look different. You are to be different. You are to be extraordinary. Many years ago, I was at, in Bible school, and I was walking with a team. There was like 20 of us. We were walking down the streets. We were doing these prayer walks, and because and, we would go and evangelize in these neighborhoods of, of, of Dallas, and we were doing these, before we would start evangelizing, we would do these prayer walks. The whole team would basically march around these, these neighborhoods twice. We would do these prayer walks, and I remember on one of them, somebody came up to us and approached us, and they're like, who are you guys? And we're like, what are you talking about? We're just students at a Bible school. And this is what they said. I don't know if they were high. I have no idea what was going on with them. This is what they said. You're eyes are on fire and I remember looking at my friend's eyes and I couldn't see that fire I was like you're all right we walked a little bit further and another person stopped us same thing who are you guys there's fire in your eyes who when you're the people of God, you're different. The world knows it. You need to know it. We are called to be the light in this generation. I don't know how many of you know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's found in Daniel chapter 3 and verses 1 through 30. But basically, I'm going to paraphrase it to you, although I think you should read it because it's really important. There's some details that I'm going to miss. But Daniel... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were in captivity in Babylon. And you have to understand why Babylon did this, okay? Babylon would take all of the, all of the like, people of, 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 of higher upbringing, their princes, their leaders, their, 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 you know, whoever was a person of influence, when Babylon would conquer a nation, they would take all of those people and they would move them out of the nation and they would bring them into Babylon to be indoctrinated in the culture and religion of Babylon. That's why Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were actually in Babylon. All the common folk were left in Israel, and they were left in Israel because there was, they were no threat. Listen to me. The common folk were left in Israel because they were not a threat. And everyone that could be threatening, they would take out of Babylon, and they, I'm sorry, out of, out of Israel, or the nations that they would conquer, and they would bring them into Babylon to indoctrinate them into the culture of Babylon. Okay? You getting this? You understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm telling you something really important. If you're not a threat, the devil doesn't care what you do. He'll leave you alone. If you're not a threat, your life is like everything is no problems. Your job, you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you go to work, you come home, you eat dinner with your family, you come to church on Sundays, and you do the, the you know, the, the thing, the, you know, the check the box thing. But if the devil doesn't see you as a threat, he's going to leave you alone because you're better that way. You're like, he doesn't have to do anything to you. But the moment you decide to serve the Lord, can I tell you something? The moment you decide to, th to serve the Lord, there's going to be pushback. There's going to be stuff that happens. You're going to get flat tires here and there. You know what I mean? Like, things, weird things are going to happen. Because the devil wants to distract you. You know how often... My dreams are tormented from Saturday to Sunday. Just about every Saturday to Sunday. When I'm going to preach, I, I, I have a bad time. I have a bad night's sleep. I don't know if the devil thinks if he's, if he's tired, he's not going to be all. You know what? The moment I get here, the Holy Spirit energizes me. 
Yeah, no, like, like, like listen, when I get home, I'm dead. Like, I'm like, you know, I'm like, Duh, like a hammer hits me, you know, like, uh, Christy, what do you need? You know? Like, you can torment me all you want at night. It doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is going to recharge me, right? The Bible says, you know, those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Good luck. You know what I mean? But what I'm telling you is when, when you're no threat, the devil's going to leave you alone. And so, so all of these leaders of Israel were taken out of Israel and brought to Babylon to be indoctrinated. And there, they, they, would, they would actually hold positions of, of influence. They were recognized as being these, these, uh, these leaders, and so they were put in positions of influence. And you'll see that throughout Daniel, and you look at, look, read the book of Daniel, read, read Ezra, read, read Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the cupbearer. You know what I mean? They were all exiled from, from, from Israel. And so Babylon, so you know, you may not know this, but Babylon has always, in the Bible, represented a place of darkness and confusion. It has always represented wickedness. As a matter of fact, its very name comes from Babel. That's where the Tower of Babel was built up. And Babel, we now understand it to mean confusion, right? That's when somebody's babbling, what are they doing? They're just rambling. They're speaking without purpose. Babylon is always in the Bible represented wickedness. It is represented evil. It is represented darkness. In the book of Revelation, there's this thing called Mystery Babylon that's going to, it's going to um, basically deceive the nations. And, and I believe it's this worldwide religion, this Mystery Babylon that originated in Babylon that will somehow make a, a resurgence and, and it will appear to be so good for everybody else because, you know, but, but in, it, in its core, it's evil. It's wicked. It intended to take all of of those that had influence and bring them into Babylon and indoctrinate them with wickedness. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in Babylon, and they're given these places of honor. Verse 2 says that they were called the princes or the satraps. Those are the wise people, those that were giving counsel to the king. And, and then they're all brought, and you may know this story, and if not, then I suggest that you go watch VeggieTales, and, and you can see... The one about the bunny, the bunny, the bunny. They're all made to bow down to this statue, right? So the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, ra ra raises up this statue. And this statue represents all of the wickedness of Babylon. We're not told what was the image of the statue. That, the Bible doesn't tell us what the statue was. But we know that this statue represents all of the wickedness of Babylon. And they are told that at the sound of the trumpet, everybody is to kneel down to this, um, um, to this statue. And if they don't, that they will be burned. They will be cast into a pit of fire and they will be burned alive. You know the story, right? I'm telling you, if you don't, just go watch Veggie Tales. You'll know the story. My point is, they're, they're, they're put into this thing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Bible tells us that they refuse to bend their knee. And here's why. Because they stood firm on the truth and their convictions. That's what the Bible tells us. And, and I'm paraphrasing it for you in so many words. So what happens is, they're thrown into the fire, but prior to being thrown into the fire, King Nebuchadnezzar makes, makes the, his, his people make the fire seven times hotter. Okay? And so the king's like, you won't bend your knee? Make the fire seven times hotter. And then the Bible says that they are cast into the fire, and the fire was so hot that the people that threw them in were consumed as they were throwing them in, like they burnt, like they were consumed. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they're thrown into the fire. But before they're thrown in there, they say something that's really, really important. Verse 17. I want you to go with me to Daniel chapter 3. And verse 17. Here it is. You ready? It says like this. If our God, I'm not going to read NET. Let me read it. NIV. Here we go. 
from the NIV, this is what it says. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. He will deliver us from your majesty's hand. And so, of course, they're thrown into the fire. And as they're in the fire, the Bible says that there is a fourth that walks among them. We don't know who this fourth is. Bible scholars, of course, think it's, it's, a, it's a type form of Jesus Christ. Jesus was walking in the fire with them. There's, there's a really cool song uh, today. It's a worship song. There was another in the fire. You know what I mean? That, 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 that's that, what this song is about. Okay? This fourth person is in the fire, and the Bible says they're walking inside the fire. Like, je- this young people, like, this was fire. You know what I mean? Like, this was real fire. You know what I mean? They were walking in the fire. And so the king sees them walking in there, and he says, bring them out. And so they come out, and the Bible says they didn't even smell like smoke. They couldn't, they didn't even smell like smoke. And so then King Nebuchadnezzar recognizes that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the real God, and he makes all of Babylon Honor God. Now listen, when I'm telling you about changing the culture, this is what I'm talking about. We're not going to attack the culture. And I want to give you, there are three keys that I see in, in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that allowed them to change the culture. Not, not counter the culture, not say this is evil and this is wrong. They just said They were going to do something because of their convictions. And so here it is. There are three keys. I'm going to give them to you real quick. Number one, if you want to change the culture, the number one thing is obedience to God. Obedience to God. See, the Bible says, the second commandment, anybody know the second commandment? Thou shalt not make, what? Any graven image. Of any material, I'm I'm paraphrasing it for you, but it basically says of stone, of wood, of any material. Do not make any graven image to bow down to it and to worship it. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were familiar with God's laws. They had been trained up in God's laws. They knew the law of God and they acted in obedience. Even under the threat of death. They decided to obey. Now, let me tell you something. The decision to obey was not made at that moment. They had already decided what they were going to do if that came. If that moment came, they already knew what they were going to do. They were not like, um, should we go to church today? This is, this is the mistake a lot of us make today. You're living day by day. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. You're walking around without vision. Now listen, the devil has a 20-year vision for your life. He has a 20-year vision for your life. He's not going to destroy you all at once. He destroys you little by little. Because he's got a 20-year vision. He's, he, goes, he knows if he can just pervert you right now, this little bit, 20 years down the line, you'll be fully indoctrinated. You'll be fully indoctrinated. And so pay attention. The vision, the, the, do you have vision? Because the Bible says where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew they were living in a culture of darkness. And so they knew there would be a time when they would have to act upon their convictions. And the decision had already been made. It wasn't made at that moment. They already knew where they stood. Do you know where you stand? Our young people, they wear shirts. They say P91. And on the back of the shirt, you know what it says? Where do you stand? Do you know where do you stand? Obedience to God. Even under the threat of death. See, if you, if you already know what you're going to do when that moment comes, it'll protect you 
from people's wrong expectations. People will expect you to bend your knee. That's what they're going to expect. That's why they talk so much garbage about Christians. They're going to expect you to bend. Well, I know that, you know, we're, we're just evil. We're so mean sometimes. I love when Dr. Moreland came, he said, you know, tolerance is, the, the, the way that the world talks about tolerance is immoral. Because they're acting you to not tell people the truth. That's what they want. They don't want you to tell them the truth because it will hurt them. Well, can I tell you something? The truth hurts. But can I also tell you something? The truth saves. Tell your young people the truth. Parents, do not withhold the truth from your kids. Tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. It'll protect them, right? You need to live to please God. So number one, obey God. Number two, they had conviction. What is conviction? It's, it's faith. It's trust. They were convinced. As a matter of fact, that's what the Bible defines as faith. It's a, con I am fully convinced. Are you fully convinced? They were going to obey God because they were fully convinced. They had conviction. See, faith is not believing in God. It is believing God. Even the devil believes in God, but he doesn't obey him. Do you believe God and what he says about you? Or what he says about your future? Or what he says about your eternity? And when you can stand on that, you will have conviction. Later in Daniel, also in Babylon, Daniel has a vision of this man who later is known as the man of lawlessness. And the Bible says this man of lawlessness, this prince who will, it says, who will deceive the nations. It says that he will even deceive the keepers of the covenant. This is Daniel 11. This man of lawlessness will even deceive the keepers of the, of the covenant. And he says, with flattery. You're such a good person. You know, I just love, are you so kind? Are you so sweet? You know what I mean? Just remember, all roads lead to heaven. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. Now listen, but what does it continue to say? But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. The King James Version, I love it, says, but those who know their God will stand strong and do great exploits. Do you know your God? What he's capable of? See, verse 17, it says, the God we serve is able. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. The God we serve, he is able. They weren't talking about some God they had heard about. They were talking about the God that they knew. Right? Like, do you know God? Do you know God? Let me, let me give you an example. I have a friend. His name is Luis Robles. Okay? He was born here in Fort Huachuca. He went to college at uh, University of Portland, the Pilots. He became a, a goalie for their soccer team. Later, he was drafted um, by D.C. United, but decided instead to go play in Germany. He played in the second division of the German Bundesliga, and he played soccer there uh, for many years before coming back to the United States. And then he ended up playing for the New York Red Bulls. Today, he holds the record for the most consecutive games played by any player like the MLS Iron Man, if you want to call it that. He later moved to uh, uh, Miami and played for Miami for two seasons before finally retiring. He is married to an amazing woman. Her name is Kara, and, and they, they have three beautiful kids, and, and they're just lovely, lovely people. How many of you know Luis? I mean, do you know Luis, or do you know about Luis? I just told you about Luis. You might know of him, but do you know Luis? And see, there's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And sometimes as a people, we lack conviction. You know why? Because we know about God. Convictions are not forged in, 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 in like secondhand knowledge. Josh, who's sitting here, he's, he's the associate pastor of Lifehouse, but he's also one of my closest friends in the entire world. I've known him for 20 years, and we're, we're, we're friends. I can honestly tell you, he's my friend. We've, we've duked it out 
gone through the fire. You know what I mean? We've duked it out, and we've, we know that we're, we're good friends. We are friends. I know him, and he knows me. Does that make sense? We know each other. I have confidence in who he is. And even though there are moments when we disagree, I know that he'll have my back, and he knows that I'll have his back. Does that make sense? That is not. That is to know God. See, Jesus said in the, in the last days, many will come and they will say, Lord, did we not in your name do this and that, et cetera, et cetera. And he's going to say to them, depart from me, doers of evil. I never knew you. Now, that knowledge is not just like, of course, Jesus knows you. Right? I mean, you exist because of him. You exist because he made you. He knows who you are. But he says, depart from me, I never knew you. He's talking about an intimate knowledge. Convictions are forged in real knowledge. Now listen, when you have real knowledge of God, you stop focusing on your circumstances. And see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they had conviction that, was, that went beyond their circumstances. They were truly being thrown into the fire the fire was seven times hotter. They probably saw the men being consumed by the fire who were throwing, going to throw them in. They knew it was a real fire. They were real circumstances, but they weren't moved by the circumstances. See, they didn't say, today we're going we're gonna to walk in the fire, we're going to live. They said, our God is more than able to deliver us, and he will surely deliver us from your hand. Because even if they had died, they would have been delivered from the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. They had a confidence that went way beyond their circumstance. You have to have that. See, Satan is the ruler of the kingdom of darkness, and he will always try to use strategies to destroy you, including threatening you, making, time, making things look seven times bigger, just to see if you will back down. And number three, you need obedience, you need conviction, and you need meekness. Meekness can be defined as strength under control. It means you have the authority, but you, you don't use it. You don't exercise it. You have the strength, but you don't use it. You don't exercise it. You bring it under control. That's what meekness is. If we want to change the culture, we're going to change it with meekness. The Bible says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. When they stood there, they didn't, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't say, oh, you pagan king, you want to make us bow down to this, this is disgusting, and our God is going to, no, they, said, they honored God. As a matter of fact, they said, oh, great king. They continued to address Nebuchadnezzar with the official title that he had, oh, great king. They honored him. They had probably the right to tell him, you wicked king, but they didn't. They honored him. If we're going to make a difference in our community, we're going to have to be meek people. As people come up and they come up for father of lights and maybe they're coming up and maybe they're dressed as vampires and their kids are, are dressed as ghouls and, and witches. And you're like, how could, you, how could you dress your kid into a witch? And you know, I'm like, what were you thinking? Do you know like what a witch is? Like, do you, you know, you, you, you're not going to do that. You know what you're going to do? Come on up. Come on in. You know what I mean? Like, there's light in here. Come on into the light. You know what I really think? I really think the moment they step from the sidewalk onto my property, they are standing on holy ground. And, and you know what? That means I have home court advantage. You know what I mean? Like, my house is an extension of the kingdom of God. So the moment they step onto my property, they've taken a step out of their darkness for a second, for a moment, and they stepped into the kingdom of light. And that means I can love on them and share the gospel message with them. And I can do that with meekness. That's what we have to do. If we want to change the culture, it's not about telling them how wrong they are, how perverted, how wicked they are. We're going to do it by obeying God, we're going to do it by having deep convictions, and we're going to do it by being meek. 
We're going to address people with respect and with honor. And we're going to love them. And we're going to serve them like Jesus would. That's how we change a culture of darkness. Are you with me? Heavenly Father, we want to be the people that you have full confidence in. That you can entrust us with big tasks like with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I pray right now over Lifehouse as a whole that they will experience the grace to change the culture of darkness by being the light that you have called them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you and may he cause his face to shine upon you. Go out and be the light. Amen. Hey, welcome friends and family. Welcome yes, welcome back. And uh, what a powerful message that was. You know, uh, sometimes we need to be reminded of these things. Um, and if we're in the Word, we'll, we will spot these things um, about darkness. And I just want to uh, uh, tell you about this. Uh, I don't know if, if Pastor uh, Jorge mentioned this. Um, it's uh, about Daniel. And this is this is interesting, you know. Um, in Daniel chapter three, verse let me see, was it eighteen? I believe. Yep. It says, "But even if he doesn't, you know, even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, Your Majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold or statues that you have set up." You know, it uh, it's amazing because um, Misha. Rashad and Shadrach and Abednego, they uh, they trusted in God so much so that they say, even if God doesn't deliver us, they had trust that he would deliver them. But even if he doesn't, you know, we will not serve your gods. That's that's a powerful message. And and even now and and, uh, you know, people are celebrating Halloween or celebrating darkness, you know. Amazing things, even through this uh, this festival that we're gonna do on October 31st tomorrow. Um, just just believe that God will change lives. You know, I approach this, babe. I, I I know I'm saying a lot. I'm gonna let you speak here, but um, you know, God God, we seen Him move so many so many times. You know, and um, every time we pray for someone because they they come broken and they need prayers even we need prayers sometimes so so i pray that um that you will be encouraged you will shine the light wherever you're at and uh, work you know uh these dark places but uh it's an opportunity for us to you know bring bring jesus in every situation right yes absolutely yeah. um so, you know, if anybody's out there watching or maybe if someone shared this with you, we just want to encourage you to, to seek God on your own. If you're not saved, if you don't know what it's about, find someone that you know is a Christian and they're walking, they're walking their faith. They, they, are, they have a, that light in them of Jesus. So find somebody like that and ask them, you know, what is it about? And... Just, just pursue him, right. and you know, just give him your life. Amen. Trust in, trust in the Lord, and he's gonna do amazing things in you. So, just want to encourage you to do that. Amen. And let's uh, close out with a word of prayer then. And so, Father, we come before you, Lord God, knowing that you are mighty God, and there's nothing impossible for you, Lord. And and it's with our, uh, with our faith, Lord God, knowing who you are, Lord God, that I, we know that you're gonna be moving um, tomorrow, Lord. I pray, Father God, that, Lord, uh, the light will shine in every house, Father God, that, that we're going we're gonna to pr be praying. And I, I just pray that, that you bring the right people, Lord Jesus, that you bring the right person. I pray, fa Father, for, for uh, words of knowledge, Lord God, um, about the people that are coming, Lord God, so they can know and see that, that you're operating, you're operating, you're moving, Lord God, and 
and, and bring convictions to their heart so they could come uh, to you, Lord. I thank you, God, for what you're about to do tomorrow. I pray, Father, for all of us, Lord God, not to be afraid of, of, of speaking uh, loudly and uh, about you, Lord, about who you are, because you're great, faithful, and true, Father. I just thank you for what you're doing, and I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, so uh, until next time, we'll see you soon.